Hello, hello everybody, and welcome back to another episode of The Guru. And for Guru today, we got a very great guest, and he stars in Break Every Chain, and he also stars in a horror movie that's going to be coming out called Light Dogs. And I'm really looking forward to talking to him, but I'm going to wait till he comes inside the Guru room today because I don't want to screw up his name. And as soon as he comes on, I'm going to have him say his name and then the interview is going to start. So I'm really looking forward to talking to him about, about these films and about life. And it's going to be a fun interview, so stay tuned. I am Rocco Cross. I am the host of Stutters. I am the host of the Guru room. Coming up next is our guest of honor. All right, everyone. Welcome, welcome to Guru, and and thanks so so much for taking time out of your day to come on the show and and being a guest. And want to start the show off by uh, I I wanted to say your name earlier, but I didn't know how to say it. So definitely gonna have you say it. <laughs> so uh, my name is Ignacio Matinia, and it's uh, it's great to be on. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, as as many times as I would try to say that in in my head, I probably would say it wrong. Yeah, that's okay, man. You got to give it a try one day. Okay. Pro promise me one day you'll give it a try. Okay, I promise. <laughs> so, um, I, I was I was reading up on you and and how how long did you live in in Pol in Poland for? So I was born in Poland, and we came to the United States in 1996. Oh, wow. So uh, we were in Poland for about three and a half years. Well, 1995, 1996, that's when we moved out over here. And when we moved here, uh, I lived in, well, we moved to Florida and then to Tennessee and then back to Florida and then to New York, where we stayed for the, uh, for the majority of my life. Oh, wow. Nice. Yeah. It, is that where you're living at now, too? Yeah, so right now I'm back in New York. Uh, I'm actually working on something out here. I was living in Los Angeles from 2019 uh, for the full span of the year and into 2020. And then, oh, wow. as you know, COVID hit. Um, work kind of went to, it came to a screeching halt. And I came back to New York to stay with my family just because I felt like the time was, the time was right to, to, to be around loved ones. Oh, wow. Nice, nice. Yeah, I mean, I, I was telling you earlier i'm actually not too 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 right. far in philly in philly. philly yeah yeah it's very cool have you ever made it have you ever made your way up to new york oh yeah plenty plenty of times actually last last weekend i was there. really i've been to <laughs> philly I, went, I was actually shooting a, a pilot for a television show a couple of years back it's one of my favorite projects i've worked on it's not listed on my imdb because it's really to it. yeah and the one thing i learned about philly is you guys have the worst potholes in the entire nation the worst. It's terrible. And parking. It's so tight. Parking's horrible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, if you're trying to, if you're coming home from work or coming home from a club or out to eat or anything, as soon as you come up the street looking for parking, you'll, you'll circle around the, the neighborhood for like an hour just before it, and just looking for a spot and, and hoping someone pulls out so you can pull in. <laughs> I'm telling you, uh, Brooklyn is very similar. Okay, you, won't yeah, find, really? you, you won't find a spot. <laughs> yeah, you, oh some, you get lucky on the weekends, though. But during the week, it's a, it's a nightmare. People are ruthless. Oh. Wow. Okay, so, so that's like Philly, then. Do you guys have it where uh, people own driveways, but they don't want to park in their own driveways? Yeah. So they just ruin it for everybody? I don't understand. Yeah. yeah, people are like that here. Yeah, they'll, they'll like put lawn furniture on their driveway and it and like a grill and stuff and or nothing and or, just nothing. <laughs> or just nothing and it's just a you know just we just want it open just in case anything happens <laughs> sure. Sure. you're right about that oh my god wow so i thought i thought philly was like the only spot where you can't find any parking spaces <laughs> No, dude, if you ever come out here to hang out, I'll show you how just how bad it is. Okay. <laughs> so when you were in Philly, did you try out our our famous cheesesteaks? I did, and you guys have Pats and Geno's, right? Pats and Geno's, yeah. All right, let me ask you, which I, I, for some reason, I have like this dyslexia between the names, and I forget which mm -hmm. one's which. So the one that doesn't look like a super mall, which, which one is that? The one that looks like a hole in the wall. That's which Pats. one is that? Okay, I like Pats. I'm a fan of Pats. 
and they have like the uh the little display of cherry peppers yes. and like napkins yes. yeah that place is awesome the other place is too commercial for me well it, it's it's very bright the other place is it okay so it, you think the other place is better well no no me personally i like pats better but G, gino steaks like you could see gino steaks a mile away because they're it, it's so it's so they got so many lights and it you're right they've got, they've it, got it the actually looks like a mall they've got the lights but they don't have the flavor that's true, you know, that's true. i can't i can't eat the lights <laughs> Well, and, 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 and plus I, I, I have to say Pat's cause my, my cousin is one of the, the, the bosses of Pat Steaks. So. Okay, so this is the Pat's commercial. Let's go, let's go Pat's. Yeah. I mean, regardless, even if I, I, I totally like their food a lot more and I learned like when I was over there, there's a special way to order your cheesesteak. I forgot yeah. about it, but you have to know how to say it. There's like a jingle, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a lot of personality. I, that's that's the one thing that I like about it. it. Reminds me of Brooklyn. Nice, nice. Well, Pat's is where I'm at. I I live in is South Philly. Okay. And um and South Philly is like its own area. Like it, it's so different from the rest of Philadelphia. <laughs> like everyone okay. in South no, Philly is so different. <laughs> That's where that's where I uh, that's where I shot the the pilot. We were in the there's a marketplace like up the block from where Pat's and Gino's is, mm-hmm. and we shot a few scenes up there. Um, but yeah, like the potholes, we sh- we shot around the potholes. Yeah, it was, it was a great time. Yeah, you, every every time you drive up the street in Philly, you're gonna you have to pray. Your, your car is gonna shake. <laughs> yeah, it's like you hit the you hit that one pothole that you like. You just hope to God didn't just kill you completely. <laughs> Yeah, it's like that. I, w- I drove, I, I went down there one day because my director likes riding motorcycles. Oh, so I was nice. like, oh, I'll ride my motorcycle to Philly and then we'll ride around. And you guys have some really, uh, you got some really cool, cool, uh, cool parks in the, in the area. Yeah, definitely. But if, definitely. if you hit a pothole, it's, it's game over. It's game over. <laughs> yeah. It's like an obstacle course. Yeah, if you're riding a bike, you definitely have to keep, keep your eye out for the potholes. That's for sure. <laughs> um, I, I was uh, like I said, I was I was re- I was reading up on you, and I saw like you were in in medical school, and you left medical school for acting, right? Yeah. Yeah, that was uh, my parents hated me for that one. <laughs> That was, uh, that was a really uh, that was a tough decision. I think in my life, in the, in the grand scheme of things, I think that was the first time I ever made a conscious decision that would affect my life that I wasn't turning back from. It was a very oh, planned yes. out decision um, in the sense that I wasn't happy with what I was doing and I felt like I was living by other people's rules on my life. And nice. this was me taking control of my own life. Nice. Yeah, I went to SUNY Albany. It wasn't meds. It was uh, it was pre med. I was I was on my way to med school. Oh, okay. I was doing pre med, and I left my uh, my senior year of college uh, with just a few credits shy of graduating. Oh wow! Yeah, I mean, I did that because I'm the kind of person that uh, if I have a if I have a safety net, then I'll rely on that safety net. Mm-hmm. And a wise person once told me, if you have a plan B, you're setting plan A up to fail. So I removed the plan B and I put all my focus and energy on plan A. Nice. Nice. So, so like if, if, if your friends or, or, or family are sick, do they, do they, do they call you up and ask you all kind of questions on how to treat what they got? <laughs> no, not, no. But I'm sure if I played a doctor on television, I, I'd be the first person everyone called because they'd probably think I was a real doctor. <laughs> I mean, if I did it a good job, if I did a terrible job, then they they would probably never know. <laughs> so, what what like drew you to the to the world of of at of at acting? acting? Like, what made made you want to act? Um, I don't I don't think it was like something I knew all my life. Okay. Was, uh, when I was in high school, I I got um I got like scouted to work at a DJ company. I was like a oh, dance. Nice. You know, and I, I was dancing at a party one day and one of the one of the guys that worked there asked me if I was interested in working and 
they gave me a card and I thought about it. And then one day they brought me into the office and I met the team of people and I was 16 at the time and I wanted a job because I was 16. I would get invited to all the sweet 16s. I would dance at them. Uh, nice. I, made cool, I made great money having fun on the weekends, you know? And I think that, I won't, I, that was pretty much my first uh, introduction to entertainment. Um, uh -huh. And from there, I, I learned how to DJ. I taught myself how to talk on the microphone. And uh, really quickly, I learned the ropes of what it meant to be an entertainer. And when I went away to college, uh, I had a teacher who suggested that I try it out. On a whim, I was given a presentation. She was like, oh, you're really good at speaking to, uh, to public. And I think you should, you know, try your hand at this. Nice. And so I, 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 I didn't think much of it. Um, but like, I was like, you know, what? let me let me see if I can get into one of the classes here at Albany. And I, I, I emailed uh, one of the professors that were in charge of the theater department. And I asked if I could, uh, if I could, you know, try out one of the classes or, or take it as like a, an elective course. So I was majoring in biology and minoring in biochemistry. Oh, okay. And when I when I asked if I could do that, they told me my course load was too big and that it's a, it would be a waste of my time, especially since this is like a curriculum meant for people who aren't doing it as a hobby. It was more meant for people that are taking it seriously, and they didn't let me in. And so oh, I was wow. like, yeah. And something about that um, set a set of spark in my mind, and I was like, let me let me see what this is all about elsewhere. And then I. I tried taking a few courses, um, some like, you know, off the beaten path classes in Manhattan, uh, acting classes. And from there, I, I met someone uh, who was my mentor, this guy, Sedley Bloomfield, who offered to work with me. And at that time, I had just dropped out of college because I decided I wanted to do acting. And, yeah. and he, uh, he taught me everything I knew. And then I went on and did everything on my own. And 10, ten years later here, well, nine years later, here I am. <laughs> Wow, that's great. Uh, that's I, I. I mean, I. I love hearing. Dude, hearing, hearing I, I gave like you the that. most great Spark notes version of the story. It, it, it's really detailed, but I'm sure one day. I'm sure one day I'll, I'll have a chance to tell you about it. Oh, nice. Okay. Yeah. That, like I love hearing that. Like, you, you, like some some when someone is knows that they don't want to be at the job that they're at and they find their passion and they find something they really love doing like i love hearing about that it's usually right in your face too it's like you can't you can't help it you know you you could either say yes or no but it's being presented to you constantly in and out of itself and you just have to be smart enough and observant enough to realize when that thing is like telling you like come you know take a leap of faith go after exactly. it we'll, exactly. we'll take care of you if you do and like luckily it's been it, it was that for me i took that leap of faith and you know for a long time i was really nervous and i think the hardest obstacle was the dropping out of college and telling everybody why i was doing it everybody look at you like you're crazy you know? <laughs> i'm they, sure they, yeah they tell you, you should go back to school this isn't this is never going to work out it's too late you're too old mm. and i was you know i was 19 at the time 19 20 so the hardest obstacle was definitely uh, overcoming what other people were telling me that I should be doing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. How exactly. did you? How did you get into? Uh, how did you get into this? What made you want to start interviewing people and just? Um, well, me, <laughs> me, me, and one of my friends, we 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 had a heart. I mean, we still have the we we have a horror and rock site, and um and because me and him we we've been best friends since we were like little, little kids. And mm -hmm. the one thing we always loved was horror movies and rock music. <laughs> so one day we just decided to open up a website that's dedicated to just horror films and rock music. And we interviewed like stars from horror movies. And but on the site, it, it's, it's only written interviews. Like we, we, I would send over questions for for them, and then they would they would write out the questions and email me back the answers, and then I would write an article up and post it on the site. And but I mean, we got some like really good people doing do, doing that. Like, like um, Tara Reed did it, and uh, William William Shatner and Dan Rad Radcliffe and Lisa Wilcox from Freddie, and like we. We got like a whole bunch of people that, that were happy to do an interview for the site. And when COVID hit, um, 
I, I saw like a lot of a lot of people were doing video interviews and they were the ones that were getting the most views and the most watched. And no one was really reading interviews anymore. That's like a thing of the past. <laughs> I mean, so, I, I I appreciate the uh, the tenacity and just the 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 leap of faith you took to reach out to these people because I feel like uh, the thing that's stopping most people from succeeding is just having the confidence and just the not caring of what happens if you do reach out to them and get a no. Oh, yeah. So like you know, I, I I appreciate that. That's really cool that you started off that way and. I'm sure in hindsight, looking back, you can see like the ladder of how yes. it came to be. And like, still, I feel like you're still on just like the, you're not even where you want to be. You're just on this journey. And five or 10 years from now, you'll be looking back and saying, wow, you know, I was doing video auditions, reaching out to people <laughs> on Instagram to just see who would want to come on the show and posting right. it. Dude, that's really admirable. That's Thank really, really you. admirable. Thank you. Thank and, you. and, you know, you have the whole thing on your page where you were, uh, you were like, the, you're the guy with the stutter. And yes. like, and I'll be honest with you, you, you don't have that bad of a stutter. You really, you really came a, a long way from what I think you were a few it, years back. It definitely had, it, I, it, it, it's like one of those things where it come certain interviews that I'm like really, really bad. Like, I mean, I, I think I did for video interviews now, I think I did like 140 or something like that. And uh, <laughs> Bravo. Bravo. And there are interviews like where I'm like totally just stumbling over like every every sentence and dude, you're not the only one. It happens <laughs> it happens to everyone. You know, all I, I can tell you happens to me often. Like I had a Q and A this past week and there was I was in the middle of saying a sentence and I was just like, What was I talking about? <laughs> <laughs> what? And there's like oh, four hundred people in front of me. <laughs> Luckily, it came back, but like after a very strange, awkward pause, you know. So, dude, it, it happens to the best of us. And at the end of the day, practice makes perfect, right? That, that's the true. More, the more you do it, and I feel like it's a lot. A lot of it has to do with comfortability. Oh right? yeah, definitely. I think uh, I think the secret to that is making yourself as vulnerable and honest as possible, and then it just you have nothing to lose. When you have nothing to lose, things just happen to work out, you know. Well, you, you ever watch that television show? Gotham. Oh yeah, yeah. The, the 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 Batman spinoff series. Well, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. You, you know the kid that that, that played Bruce Bruce and Wayne David Bruce Wayne? David Mazus. His name is. Yeah, yeah. Well, I had him on the show like a week ago, or and it's really cool. I was like really nervous because I I love that show so yeah, much. Yeah. And when he came on, I was a mess. And, and I, after the interview, I was so disappointed with it. Oh, and yeah. I, trust me. I, I, <laughs> I get that, too. I, uh, like, I, was, I, I wanted this interview to go so good that I stumbled over, like, almost every sentence. And... See, that's the thing. Like, when you, when you put <laughs> the, the, um, the final product on the pedestal and you keep thinking about how it needs to be, that's where you, that's where you sabotage yourself. And I... I used to do that with myself with acting. When I, when I started and I used to go on auditions, I used to think like, you know, this is a big person I'm auditioning for. This is like, even if it was a small part on a TV show, I was like, I'm never, in your head, you think you're never going to get another audition again and you have to nail it. And you put so much pressure on yourself and it trips you up and you don't get it and you beat yourself up over it for days. And it's like in the middle of the night, you wake up and you're like, oh God, I messed up that audition five years ago. What's wrong with me? So, yeah, dude, it's, I think that's one of the most important things, the, the perseverance of overcoming those and knowing it's going to be okay. Eventually, you reach a breaking point where you're like, I don't even care. I don't care anymore. I don't care who these people are. I'm excited to meet them, and whatever happens, happens, you know? Like, yeah, definitely. I think, so I share that sentiment with you. Oh, my God, man, you have no idea. I, I get it. I get it. But don't beat yourself up before. You'll, you'll, you'll have another chance, and you're just going to keep growing. You're going to keep getting better. Oh, yeah. And, well, and these people are going to end up being your friends if you end up becoming like a Jimmy Kimmel, you know? That that was like the the second time we did an interview with him, the the Bruce Wayne kid from Gotham. The first interview, my, my buddy interviewed him. And of, of, of course, the interview went smooth because my buddy doesn't have a stutter. So oh, that was... <laughs> <laughs> so like the first interview with him went smooth and now and this one didn't go as smooth because i'm the one that did it <laughs> yeah, it's a, remember dude it's a two-way street 
You know, <laughs> not just you. It's a two way street. That's true. I but, hope he, I hope he's beating himself up over it. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I don't want anybody upset. <laughs> when I first started doing the video interviews, because um, like, like I said, when me and me and my buddy, when when we were doing the interviews for the site, I would do mm-hmm. the written ones, and my buddy would do the phone Camera. ones. Because right, there, right. there, there'd be certain stars that wanted to do phone phone interviews, and certain ones that just want, wanted to do the written ones. Gotcha. So I would do the written, and he would do the phone because you know he didn't have the stutter, and I did. So I would hide behind the keyboard. <laughs> no, and to then, be to be honest, I feel I feel much more comfortable knowing that there's someone that's okay messing up with me, so I'm not the only one. <laughs> Cause I'm, I'm terrible at these dude. <laughs> so thank you. You, I, I think you're going to go a long way because of that factor, because that, like thank you, you. you have the courage to, to get up there when other people who don't have any issues ha- don't have the courage. So mm-hmm. keep at it, man. Well, I, on, on my page, when I put like, you know, I'm, I'm rock, I'm the host that stutters and this and that, like I didn't put that at, at first, when I first started doing the video interviews, like I've only been doing these since probably, it's probably about, I would say nine or 10 months now that I've been doing. Since COVID, right? Yeah, since like COVID. And um, when I first started doing them, you you know, I was real nervous. Of course, I wasn't as good. And, um, And then I did a couple live interviews on, I I I G television Instagram live and I I would see all these comments like shooting up oh this guy don't know what he's doing he's stumbling over his words keeps stuttering and after I read all those comments I at first I was like really hurt and I was and I was sad and then I was like you know what I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna add on the page that I have a stutter problem, so you You're not know. A victim. You ahead don't of time play the now. victim, man. You didn't play the victim. <laughs> um, I see that a moment like that in people's life and like people's psychology that some people don't overcome an obstacle like that. Some people let that hold them back, and then they don't do it again. And I think that's uh, it's inspirational. I think a lot of people come to me with like me at least pursuing acting. You know, yeah. they're like, I would never think of doing that. And so the same goes for you. Like, you know, people would probably get tripped up on that incident and never go back. And it's terrible that you said, I'm not going to be the victim. I'm the guy who stutters and I'm going to do interviews. Yeah, no yeah, one's exactly. going to take away from you. you know? And that's important. I think that's a very valuable lesson for a lot of people to take in, especially when watching your show, to know that they can also you know, do anything they want because of, and they shouldn't have any problem with anything that they have on their own affecting it. You know. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, just to be honest. <laughs> so like what, what was what was the first the first gig you ever got for 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 acting acting um okay uh so when i one of the first things i did when i first started was back in like 2013 or 2014 um and from working in the dj business there was a, a videographer who like was recording like the sweet 16s that i was working at and i was like just starting i actually i was, I was studying for a little bit i was working with my mentor sedley and i was like auditioning for stuff but i never really did anything um the first thing i probably worked on was a short film that this uh one of these cinematographers these videographers from these sweet 16s offered to put me in okay and it was a it was a it was like a, it was a silly little short film called my Craigslist hookup. And it's about a girl who met a guy on Craigslist and like the guy that she met comes to the door and ends up being this dweeby geeky, weird dude. And like, he's asking her questions and she gets really frustrated at this guy that catfished her. He put this picture of me up on the internet. And then like, then the scene comes to this guy running into the car. He's my friend. And he was doing check on her to see if she was a catfish. And so then, and so this girl, like really upset and flustered that like it wasn't him starts like eating popcorn. She like starts yelling at the mirror and then I ring the doorbell and she's like, oh my God, oh my God, it's you. And yeah, it was one of those. That was the first, that was the first thing that I've, uh, I ever did. Oh my God, that's <laughs> funny. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean like professionally, if, if you ask me like what I did when I was younger, um, the first play that I ever acted in was in grade my uh my teacher miss young uh she wrote like a script silly script called casey at bat 
and I got to play like this little this young baseball kid, Casey. I don't I don't I'm not sure if we did auditions, okay. but uh, I actually think we picked the names out of a hat, <laughs> and I got lucky and I got the leading role. <laughs> Mind you, I wasn't the coolest kid in school, so all the kids were like, "Why him?" <laughs> It was the most embarrassing thing because all the kids were mad at me and I got the lead role and I was like, oh no, all these kids are going to hate me even more. <laughs> and then my mom and I, we stayed up for like two nights straight. Like um, we made me a baseball jersey out nice. like a t-shirt that we cut open. We put buttons on it. In the back, we like spray painted Casey. And that was the first thing. That was the first thing I ever, I ever acted in. Ever. Wow. Okay. Yeah. And it was picked out of a hat. <laughs> If, if that's not a metaphor for the rest of my life, I don't know what is. <laughs> and um, I saw you done a lot of the shorts. Yeah. So at I at all the shorts you've done, which which short do you think you had you had the most the most fun with? The most fun. Oh man, it had to go to um. All right, so it it has to go back to that project I worked on in Philly. Oh it really? Was, um, so it was a. It was shot, it's a, it was a 30 minute short, but it's intended to be like a proof of concept for a television series. It's called Higher Grounds. And I don't know if I'm allowed to talk about it, but screw it. Um, if you look at any of my photos on IMDb, there's like strange pictures of me dressed like a blue alien. Okay, and in this short, um, it was the story of these two aliens who came down to destroy the planet. But uh, after like, these weird human circumstances that they've never experienced. They have a change of heart, especially after, you know, a malfunction with the machine that they had to destroy the planet. They get, uh, they get excommunicated from their alien uh, civilization because they messed up and now they're stuck on earth and as literally illegal aliens. And they're part of like civilization. One of them falls in love with, uh, with, like, with one of the characters, one of the earth characters that well, human earth characters, one of the human characters on the show. And, I play the um, I play the painstakingly dumb yet sweet genius that's there to destroy the planet, but with a smile on his face. Oh, he's, you know, no, so I had it was such a it was so cool. Every morning, uh, I woke up at about five or six a.m. Me and the director, who was also acting in it, mm -hmm. um, we we stood up for about five hours every morning, four to five hours, getting our makeup done entire blue faced uh we had bald caps i had antennas it was awesome it was it was a really cool experience and like walking around philly in that outfit and having like kids run up to you wanting to talk to you and me just interacting with them in character was by far the funnest thing i think i've had like it, it was fun it was it was comical it was uh it, it was it was childish and a lot of times when you're at work you know you have to be very professional everyone's oh, yeah. on it and here it was just it was just fun it was so easy to step into the shoes of that character and working with that director and it's funny because that's where uh Kristen and i worked together on it Kristen okay. yeah, okay, yeah. yeah 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 she played she played the the love interest of the lead the girl the the earthling that was like cynical and didn't like the alien you know <laughs> it was cool it was really, really cool. That was my favorite project <laughs> thus far. <laughs> wow, that's, that's really cool. And, I mean, I'm hoping that they actually, uh, Kristen actually got a uh, game attached for a guest starring part on it that they saved to record later on. And they just finished filming that. So apparently they have, uh, they're having some traction with people that are interested in buying it or financing it further. Uh, the director, also, uh, he, he got the Vimeo staff pick for a short film he did before that. Mm -hmm. So he has a lot of traction. He's very talented. And he had a really great vision. Really great. Wow. wow. Nice. So nice. Hopefully, hopefully that comes out sometime soon. In the yeah, season. exactly. <laughs> wow. And um, like how, how was the set like being on set for Luke, for Luke Cage? Oh, that was actually, um, so that was actually really cool. Um, the, we shot at the studio in Green Brooklyn. That's where uh, ABC did a lot of their, a lot of their productions, Disney. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, since Marvel, Marvel's owned by Disney, I believe. I and so, think so. And yeah, so, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, so, yeah. So since they have all their stages down that they were also shooting that, I know that because I shot, um, I shot an ABC TV show on the same stage 
back in like 2016 or 2015. I forgot exactly. But working on Luke Cage was really interesting. I had a very small scene. It was a small part where uh, they're testing out like this infamous Judas bullet. And this is the only bullet that can like kill Luke Cage. And of course, I'm the test dummy. <laughs> um, yeah, right. Um, so before I, um, before I started shooting, um, two callbacks for the audition. Um, and the only reason I got the was to speak Polish fluently. And the characters were speaking Polish in the scene. I don't know why they picked Polish people, but fine, no problem. I'll take advantage of it. And so there were two characters in the scene. There was the guy who had the gun and was shooting the bullet. Mm -hmm. um, and in the scene, the guy actually has like this, uh, this handy cam footage where he's recording everything. And then he sets the camera down and then he does a shot, but he's never in the scene. So when I showed up to set and I booked the role, the director asked me, he was like, look, um, the way we're shooting this, uh, we're not going to see who's shooting the gun. He was like, so I'll give you the option of, because they were like, we know you booked the role for the guy that speaks and shoots the gun. They were like, do you want to be the guy that shoots and that we don't see? Or do you want to be the guy that gets shot and that we do see? And that was an interesting thing because I was like, I thought like, hey, here's my, here's my first chance to get to like speak Polish on camera, on a big TV show. And I was just not getting any of that. It's always, there's always something. Yeah. So, um, so I, I took the, uh, he was like, I took of, uh, of being the guy on camera that gets blown up. He was like, choice. He's like, you can have some fun. Um, so then they sent me back to the hair and makeup room because they were setting up the, uh, the field that we were doing the shot on. Okay. And I was in the hair and makeup room. Um, one of the guys, this African-American guy comes up to me and he introduces himself to me and he's like, Hey, what's going on? Are you working today? And I was like, yeah, uh, I'm in one scene. And I told him he was Ignacio and he was like, Oh, how are you? My name is uh, Luke. And then we go sit down and it turns out it's Luke Coulter, the guy that was playing uh, Luke Cage. Oh, like, is his first name Luke. What's his name? I think it's Luke. Mike, Mike, Mike. He's like, my name is Mike, Mike, Mike Coulter. And he was the guy playing. Luke. Um, and that day, uh, just coincidentally, Mahershala Ali was in the room. So I, and I didn't know who Mahershala Ali was before. And I didn't know who Mike Coulter was, uh, only because the show was, um, the show was under the code name Tiara, right? So oh. we didn't know it was the Marvel show. We didn't know it was anything. Yeah. All, all I knew was that it was called Tiara and it's, uh, it was going to be on Netflix. And I was like, great. Awesome. And then later on, I found out it was Marvel's Luke Cage when I started the residuals. And then my agent called me up and told me what it was. So, yeah. So, so I, was in the, I was in the makeup chair with both of them. And, like, I just talked to them briefly. They asked me what my scene was about. And I tell them that I'm, like, I'm getting shot and I blow up. And they're like, oh, that must be really cool. Then they're making jokes about me blowing up and never coming back to set again. <laughs> Stupid guys. But, um, but, yeah, but then we got to shoot the scene. And when we shot the scene, they um, – they put a vest on me underneath my shirt nice. and uh, it had like the, the it, it was like, a, what's the word? Uh, it was like a squib vest, but instead of squibs, it had like little explosions on my chest. Oh, and wow. they, had, they had a wire that was going all the way down to where the, uh, the director and all the monitors and everybody was watching. And there was one guy that was in charge of uh, setting off these little explosives. Oh, dang, yeah, yeah. that's and crazy. Was, yeah, yeah. And it was like a cue for me to know when I got shot. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. So, and so, like, we did it a few times. We tried a bunch of different falls, and that was pretty much it. I felt more like a stunt guy that day than an actor. Yeah, I was, was, I was just going to say that. Yeah, it was a great experience to work with the director and to, like, have the producers around me just seeing me work and just I just just face-to-face -face contact with people that are actually doing it in the business before wow. I was ever anywhere near doing it in the business, you know? Oh, wow. That's – wow, nice. Damn, yeah, you definitely got like stunt work in. <laughs> yeah, for sure, definitely. <laughs> and um, you also played the lead role in a film, Break, Break, Break Every Chain, yep. and Dean Kane, the former Lois and Clark uh, stars, stars in it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I did that. I, we worked on that. Um, last year at the end, it was, uh, it was during COVID um, in, I believe, uh, was it September? October? It was either September, October, or no November. I'm not sure because I did a feature film right before that. Okay. And the day I wrapped that feature film, uh, I got flown out to Virginia to star and break every chain. 
Wow. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, we, yeah, I, I got to work with Dean King, who's really cool. Um, we're on a texting basis now. So nice. <laughs> I made a, I made a celebrity friend. I've made a few over the past couple of uh, years that only that I've worked with. I, I think it's very hard to get into that circle unless you prove yourself during the work phase of it. Um, and the first scene I had, it was a dramatic, it's, it's a pretty dramatic film. Uh, it tells the story of a, it's a real life story based off of a book by the same title called Break Every Chain. Oh. Um, I played a man called Jonathan Hickory, who, by the way, is an incredible person who I'm lucky to call a friend. Um, he's a veteran police officer who, uh, over the years of his work on the line of duty, he saw a lot of death. He uh, developed some really terrible coping mechanisms um, and trauma from early on in his childhood was affecting his life. And he turned to alcoholism. He faced PTSD, depression, and uh, was, commit was, was on the fence of I'm not on the fence, but was on the brink of committing suicide. And the story, it, it, uh, it shines a light on the trauma that first responders deal with on a daily basis that isn't necessarily spoken about because of the fact that, um, at least in policing, it's uh, in the community of officers, it's seen as a weakness to show your weakness. So a lot of these men and women, they bottle up their feelings. They try to they try to act like a rock and, and hold it down and not share anything that they're going through. And eventually the pressure builds up and, you know, a lot of people end up, you know, hurting themselves. And, mm. and this story shows that this man found a way out. He found a way out and he's better than he ever was before. And like you said, you know, before we were talking about your obstacle that you faced when, when you did that and everybody commented yeah. those terrible things about your stutter, you know, you, there's yeah. an option there, you know, you could play the victim, or you could overcome it and be better and be stronger and embrace what you, uh, what you went through or who Got you it. are. And he embraced who he was. Um, he's a Christian. So he used oh, prayer, nice. God and church to help him get through it. But you know, there were, he had meetings, he had a uh, counseling sessions that helped him get through it. And, and now he helps police officers all around the world who are dealing with the same thing. And uh, working with Dean Kane on the first day was really interesting because the day before my best friend, well, one of my best friends from childhood committed suicide, not committed oh suicide, God. sorry. He, um, he overdosed and died. I don't want to call it suicide because he didn't want to die. Yeah, exactly. Um, he overdosed and died and they rearranged the schedule for me going forward. But on the first day, it was the day I found out. And so everyone was really kind to me. And uh, the scenes that we shot were like these dramatic scenes of this guy having this breakdown in this church and Dean Kane is the pastor. Who, uh, who he first told all of the, the trauma that he was dealing with too. And that day, um, I left an impression on him, I think, because uh, he went around saying some really nice things to a lot of people and, and they took me a lot more seriously. The director was really impressed with my work. And uh, yeah, it, it was really nice. He's a, he's a kind dude, very kind dude. Um, I know he's very politically involved, but while we were working, he, he, he wasn't inclined to talk politics. He was oh. there to talk about the work. He, uh, he told me about, I was asking him questions about his, uh, his career and where he started and how long he was doing it and if he had any tips or tricks to tell me. So he told me about him working on Lois and Clark yeah. and then he told me about how he got a deal to do Ripley's Believe It or Not. Oh, that's and, right. and he told me about his family, about his son, about his priorities in life. He's a really good guy, uh, objectively oh. speaking. Like he, he left a really good impression on me. And that's aside from his political views, because that's a personal thing that I oh, think. Yeah, of course. That sometimes people let that affect their judgment of people's character, and it's not necessarily the truth. You know, I'm not going to judge anyone on their political beliefs, mm -hmm. because that's what helps them live day to day. Well, you know, yeah, yeah. Financially or or religiously, whatever it might be. Um, but he's, he, was, he was very kind to me, very professional, very prepared, and very easy to, uh, to bounce things back off with. There's a lot of actors who don't listen. He's yeah, exactly. very attentive, and he does listen. Very attentive. Oh, okay. And, and like, um, you know, I was, I was, I was going to, to, to ask you, like, how, because I, I, was, I was reading on, on who you play mm -hmm. in the film, and I wanted to, to ask you, like, how – how do you like get get ready for a role as like as as dark as that? I mean, because he's in a dark place at first before 
before he sees the light. Right. Um, well, first, you know, you got to look at the text. Um, luckily, I had a lot of source material to, to go over before I got to go on set. Mm -hmm. The difficulty was a lot of these independent projects, they happen very spontaneously and things just kind of happen very quickly, you know, whether or not that's the pre-production into the production or just like you get no, or just the writing itself. Um, so I, I got told three weeks, two or three weeks before filming. Um, and a lot of projects that I've worked on, for example, the Lifetime movie I did, I was told six days before shooting that I got the part. Oh yeah. my God. Yeah, and a lot, I'm telling you, a lot of these projects do that. And a lot wow. of it with the budget um, and the network that it's airing on because these are, it, it's a machine when it comes to these projects, but Break Every Chain was less of a machine and it was more of a, the opportunity happened, a director who is getting a, a great opportunity to do his first feature film had to capitalize off of this small amount of time, a small amount of material to, to bring this man's story to life. And I had within those two or three weeks that I had, I was on another feature. So in the middle of shooting mm -hmm. that feature, I was, uh, I was studying the lines for that project and I read Jonathan Hickory's book. Oh, Excuse okay. Me. I didn't read it. I got the audible version because I, there was no way I can read, study, um, work all at the same time. So I had, to, exactly. I had to compartmentalize my brain in, in a very strange way. But I got to read his book and understand his story. Um, with that came the script that I actually got for the story. And I wanted to make some adjustments because there's some things that I felt kind of strange about some of the lines I didn't like. And you know, it's always, a, it's always a question how much creative liberty you're going to get with someone. Mm -hmm. So you have to tread water lightly when approaching a director or a producer about that because you don't want to hurt anyone's feelings. You don't want to, you don't want to seem like you're, you're the guy that knows everything. Um, <laughs> you don't. You, you, want to, you want to give off the impression that you're looking to make the best thing that you can with as little amount of time as you can. Right. And I did that and uh, I spoke to the director, Tim, and he was like, yeah, you, just tell me what it is after and I just, I just need to approve everything you do. No problem. Um, so I rewrote some of the lines. I got to speak to Jonathan on the phone for about oh, wow. a week. And, yeah, for about a week and a half, me and Jonathan were, uh, were going back and forth. I was asking him personal questions about the role and he kept telling me, Re just, just go through the book. I'm like, I am, I am, but I need to know more. You know, and I don't think he understood why until I showed up to set and I started doing what I did. Um, but, uh, but yeah, he gave me a lot of information. I got the opportunity to re there was one scene where I have a monologue and it was a proposal scene that he had to his wife before like everything went terrible. Um, so I got to, uh, I got to rewrite the scene. I spoke to Jonathan and he told me how he actually proposed. And so I tried to take the elements of what he actually said and did and bring it into the proposal in that scene. So I rewrote that scene and, uh, yeah, I mean, it was, it was a lot of uh, it was a lot of touch and go. So everything that I I, I learned I learned from Jonathan. Um, I have a lot of friends that are police officers, so I asked them a bunch of questions going into it, uh, and they were more technical questions. You know, mm -hmm. like how do you how do you walk? How do you how do you move? You know, yeah. um, how do you hold a gun? What's what's your thing? Like what's your what what was training like in the police academy? Different point of views, and then when I got on set. It was like, remember everything they said, but throw it out at the same time. Forget about all of it. Because now you're in a new realm. Um, I had Jonathan next to me. So if I ever had something that I was doing that was kind of off, Jonathan taught me how to do it. Uh, Jonathan was a motorcycle officer, a moto cop. And so he taught me how to mount and dismount a vehicle, the, the motorcycle. He taught me how to, uh, he, he gave, taught me a bunch of the protocols that motorcycle cops have to follow. Oh, he gave wow. me, yeah, so there was, there was a lot that I got to learn. I wish... I had more time to learn, but I was surrounded by great people. We had the, um, the Bridgeport, uh, West Virginia Police Department on our side the entire time, providing us full uniforms, the regalia, the, the cars, the motorcycles, everything. They were, yeah, our producer, uh, our producer did a great job to getting them on board and helping nice. us out. So, so there was never a moment where I felt like I was alone in developing this character. Um, I, I, had, I had sources everywhere I looked. And I mean, a lot of it came from me observing the police officers that showed up on mm -hmm. set, you know, and I kept asking questions. And, I, you know, there was a point where I was like, I'm sorry for asking all these questions. I just <laughs> want to get it 
right. And then they were completely cool about it. You know, uh, they showed me videos. Um, me and the director got to talk about his shot list. So luckily with a lot of independent projects, I got to work with a master, a master artist, someone that hasn't had the opportunity yet to show his skill. And that was the director of this film. His name is Tim Searfoss. He, okay. uh, he, he didn't have much time to prepare, but he did literally as much preparation as any director would have done for any feature film. He did a great job with from the storyboards to his cinematography because he was the operator as well. Wow. Yeah. He also lit every scene and you'd be surprised if I told you the budget, your head would spin. <laughs> you know, the trailer is going to be coming out in the next, uh, in the next two weeks, I believe. I hope so. Okay. Um, because we've been having, uh, we've been having these, um, these screenings at these churches throughout, uh, throughout the United States. We had one in Phoenix, Arizona. Our last one was in Virginia. Um, I think oh, they did one that we weren't at in West Virginia and we've been getting an overwhelmingly positive response regarding it. So oh, wow. preparation, the preparation looked like it worked. Wow. That's awesome. nice. And um, I saw, I, I don't know if you're allowed to say anything about it, but there's a, a horror film that you're in that's in like, I think it's wrapped up or post post-production like, like a dogs like it's dog. called yeah. yeah so um that was actually uh back to my acting journey uh in 2018 i decided that i was going to move to la right i i paid my dues i did all these small co-starring parts in new york i did mm -hmm. over 50 short films most of them that weren't listed on imdb wow. um i i student films unpaid projects spec commercials you name it you know and i felt like you know, there's something off about New York and why, why wasn't I getting the roles that I, I really wanted? Cause I was getting them in short student films, like unpaid projects, but yeah. the roles that I really wanted just didn't exist here. So something told me that I should go to LA and for, for the entirety of 2018, I worked as a DJ and I saved up enough money. And then I started applying for jobs in LA around October, or November. I got a call okay. back for one of them. Um, and it was for the feature film like dogs and oh. I, uh, I was in New York and I got the call back and they told me that the call back was in Hollywood and I was in New York and I was kind of skeptical about going to LA. And at the time I was, I was dating someone who, okay. uh, who I was with for a long time. And, you know, that person didn't think, uh, it made any sense for me to go out there. And when I, when I asked her what she thought, you know, I kind of like already made up my mind. Mm -hmm. I went to the bathroom and I booked a plane ticket for the next day. Yeah. And then, um, and so I flew out the next day for, uh, for this callback for an independent feature film that paid pennies, you know, oh. it, paid pennies. it didn't pay a lot of money. Um, and I just wanted it. You know, I've always had this romanticized vision of Hollywood and California and the business. Like that's where everyone is. There's a reason yeah, exactly. why there. And so, um, and so I flew myself out for, for the call back and I was overtly prepared. I had everything memorized completely. I showed up to the, uh, to the audition, to the call back. And um, uh, when I was signing in, when they were asking me like what my name is and what my time was, uh, mm -hmm. the woman that was working the front door, the, the front desk, she went and grabbed the director and the director came out in front of all, there was like maybe 60 actors in the waiting room. The director came out. And he, uh, he came out and like in front of everybody, he was like, you know, I really appreciate the fact that you came all the way here from New York to audition for my film. He was like, I really like what you did on your tape. And I'm, I'm so excited to see what you do in the room. He was like, thank you. It, it's an honor to know that someone would fly out for me. And I was oh just like, Oh my God, that's awesome. Yeah. I was flustered. I was like, <laughs> and so then he walked back in the room and then like, I saw the other actors whispering, like he came, And then, and then someone came up to me like, wow, like you flew out here for, for a callback. <laughs> I was like, I was like, I want it. I was like, oh, yeah. And then, uh, and then I performed, I did a scene with one of the girls and mm -hmm. cause they were pairing us up. I did a scene with one of the girls and I like, I, I feel like I, I hit it out of the ballpark. I nailed it. I was so prepared that there was nothing that they could throw at me that I wouldn't have been able to adjust to. And they, they, t they came up to me after and they're like, can you stay a little longer? We want to. <laughs> We want to pair you up with other people. I was like, sure. 
so I ended up staying in this, uh, in this casting office. It was called space, space station casting, space station studios in Hollywood. Okay. I ended up staying at space station for like four hours as they paired me up with like different people to see what it was like reading with them. And there was one girl that just nailed it too. She was, she was nice. very dynamic, spontaneous. And her name was Annabelle Barrett and she got cast for the role. And the next day they, they thanked me for my time and mm-hmm. they were very appreciative. I left. Um, one of the other actors actually drove me back to the place I was staying at because I, I had no idea what was going on in LA. I had no idea how to get around. Yeah, it was super, super dumb with me. But they dropped me <laughs> off. Unfortunately, it wasn't the person that got the part, but bless her, I hope she's doing well. Um, the next night, uh, I was hanging out with my buddy because I was getting ready to leave the following morning. Mm-hmm. And uh, I get a phone call from the director telling me they would love to have me play the role and that I start in two weeks. And then and then, yeah, so the callback happened in December. And then two weeks later, it was January 2nd. And I flew out and I moved to California and I started my first feature film. And that film was Like Dogs. Wow. Yeah. And uh, so that film is in, um, it's in post-production. It was in post-production to hell for a long time. <laughs> uh, as, a lot of, as a lot of indie independent films do. Yeah, um, exactly. But they got a distributor and, you know, it was, it was an independent film, man. Mm-hmm. We had a, our... The, our director was a teacher at one of the universities out in California and he hired a lot of his students to work on the project because it was like it's a great way for kids to learn you know yeah, a, exactly. lot of, a lot of college students got put on board um, our DP was one of his students it was great you know it was a great experience for me and it was a great experience for them but uh, it was an it was an indie you know and oh, yeah it was an indie um but it got sold it got picked up by a distributor and it's making its round through europe i don't know when it's going to come out (laughs) i haven't i have no idea but um but yeah that was a very that was a special project for me despite the quality despite what it is i I haven't seen it yet okay uh, despite what it is um it brought me out to la and i will always be thankful to that director for for coming out of that room and just giving me the courage to feel like I I, I mattered and that my decision to come out there was important. Wow. Nice. And um, I always ask my guests this because like, like I was telling you when we first start talking that um, me and my buddy run a horror, a horror site. So I, when I have guests on, I always ask them if they like horror films and if they do, what are some of their favorite horror films they like to watch? So is that what you're asking me? What my yes. favorite horror films to watch? Yes, uh, if you like horror, like what are some I do, horror? Yeah, films? I, when I was uh, when I was younger, I used to hate it. I was terrified. I remember I was maybe I was like eight or nine years old, and um, I walked into my living room, and we were living in in Bensonhurst in Brooklyn at the time. Okay. My grandfather, my grandfather's a surgeon in Poland, so my grandfather flew in, and he was hanging out. My grandma and grandpa, who I rarely saw, were staying with us, and my dad, right. My dad was laid out on like a, on the coffee table in the living room and my grandpa was cutting a mole off of his back and sewing it back up. I walk into this, this procedure while they're watching Scream. Oh my God. So I'm sitting there in my living room while my grandfather is like cutting my dad's back, watching Scream. And I don't think I've ever been more traumatized in my life. I slept with my mom till I was about 10 years old because I was scared I was going to get kidnapped into a van and then my blood would start pouring out the van door. <laughs> Traumatized. Traumatized. But, um, but no, I love me a good horror. I love, I love me a good psychological horror, not one that's kind of just like slasher. Although, yeah. you know, I grew up with the Freddy films, the Jason oh, yeah. films. Yeah. So I, I, those movies were fun when I was young. Like they made me never want to go to camp, but, <laughs> But they were fun. Um, these <laughs> days, I love me. I love me a good soft flick. I love. I love me a good soft flick because it kind of mixed like this. Um, this mystery, this murder mystery, into like the the slasher horror. It was like a right. new, a new genre that I enjoyed. Um, I did like the conjure the first Conjuring movie. Yeah. I thought it was pretty cool. Uh, oh God! In college, Paranormal Activity really uh, it set me off. Really. I, Dude, because I mean, who doesn't wake up in the middle of the night and hear something weird moving in their kitchen? There's always something weird moving in your kitchen. That's true. I right? know it was a, until I watched Paranormal Activity, I never knew what it was, but now I know it's demons. There's demons everywhere, you know? So that, 
I, and as a filmmaker now, and, and as someone that's like getting into producing, I admire mm. the shit out of the fact that they made this movie for a, for, for no budget and have like exponentially increased their profit margin. I know. It's so well thought out, such a, and again, in hindsight, you can only say this in hindsight, because I guarantee you in the moment, everybody was like, these guys are stupid. This isn't going to make any money. It's going to be a campy horror film that's going right. to go nowhere. Lucky if they get distribution and make their money back. Mm-hmm. But, but they, they filmed something first. The studio liked what they did. It gave them more money and they filmed it again. And it made an incredible, incredible. Oh my God. Movie. It I did. Think it's the, I think it's the highest um, uh, difference between uh, budget and uh, profit in history of movies. I think. Yeah, it did really well. Right, so yeah, yeah I, 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 I love me, I love me a, a good horror, but that one, if there's one that like I was actually scared of for a while, is Paranormal Activity. That's for sure. Wow. Okay. The first ones. Everything after that, I was like, I'm not falling for this again. <laughs> and uh, like, what's on your uh, playlist? Like, what, what music are you listening to? Ah. Well, I have like a, my Spotify playlists are so messy. It's, it's, it's crazy. But um, personally, uh, it depends what kind of mood I'm in. Um, okay. When I'm, when I'm working, when I'm studying, uh, I really like listening to film scores. I, I have a playlist of, uh, of movie scores that I love. Um, some composers, uh, Hans Zimmer, uh, John Williams, uh, Fernando Vasquez. Uh, it, was, it was just a few off the top of my head, but um, there's a lot of there's a lot of television shows that are on Netflix that have great soundtracks. Uh, if I'm in like a, if I'm in the mood to go to the gym, it's a mix between uh, rock yeah. and really really ratchet hip hop, and sometimes EDM. <laughs> okay. okay. But when I go to but if I'm out at a party or if I if I want to get in a dancing mood, I love like I love dance music. I love yeah. Pitbull. Um, I think the number one song that will always get people up on the dance floor is Danza Kuduro. That song will forever get people party. There's, I, I have no doubt of that in my mind. But yeah, it all, it all, it all depends on my mood. But personally, without any judgment, if I knew people didn't, uh, if I knew like I, I wouldn't get judged, I really like classical music. Okay. I, feel like old, I feel like an old man for saying that because I didn't, I didn't for a long time. But I appreciate the... Uh, the spark in my imagination. I, mm-hmm. I, I do start, I feel things when I listen to it. I can see things in my mind's eye when I listen to it. And I appreciate that more. Nice. Okay. And is there anything coming out that you would like to plug or? Uh, well, Break Every Chain, obviously. That's coming out. Uh, that'll be coming out probably this fall. And it's, mm-hmm. a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a faith-based film that I think a lot, of, uh, a lot of the secular community might admire only because of its, uh, its effects and its, uh, its conversation with PTSD, alcoholism, depression, and just the trauma first responders deal with. Um, I do have a television show I'm working on now. Um, nice. I don't know if I can talk about it. <laughs> okay. I, I don't know. Okay. But... I'd have to like look over my contract because they made it very clear. Like anything to do with the show promotional wise has to go- be like gone through us. Has to well, be yeah. through us. But keep a lookout. I'm working on a television show that uh, I'm starring in. Oh, wow. That, that airs sometime in November. Okay. All right. Okay. Nice. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sorry for being cryptic. I, I'd love to share it. No, no trust me. I, I know how that works, yeah. <laughs> also, dude, I'm not the kind of person that uh, counts their eggs before they hatch because mm-hmm. I'm just – I'm sure you've dealt with it before, but how many times have you thought something great was going to happen and it just fizzles out and ends up being nothing? Uh, it, happens, it happens more often than I wanted yeah. to. <laughs> dude, same. So – I'm I'm kind of very like secretive and hush hush about these things just because I don't want the bad juju to get it. Well, yeah, exactly, exactly. And this show, obviously, check out this show. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. And um, where can fans find find you at? Like, what's your socials or website if you have one? 
Yeah. Um, so if you want to check me out, you can, uh, if you Google Ignacio Matenia, and that's spelled I-G-N-A-C-Y-O, and my last name is spelled M-A-T-Y-N-I-A, um, you could find the links to my website, which are www.ignaciomatinia.com. My uh, Instagram is at Ignacio NYC. Um, my Twitter, which I didn't make, my friend Bobby Golden made for me in high school, is okay. at the real Ignacio, which I'm like kind of on, but not really. I'm sure I'll be on it more when people know who I am, I guess. <laughs> Cause that's, that's what Twitter's used for. Yeah, um, I know. Yeah, catch me, catch me on any of those and uh, hopefully on your television uh, come November. Sweet. All right. I'll thank, thank you so much for, take, for taking time out to talk, come on the show. I, Rafa, thank I, you for having me. I, I appreciate you and I appreciate your tenacity to, to keep doing what you're doing. And I hope to God that one day uh, when I'm bigger and more well-known and working on something that you could probably just, you know, click, and find on netflix uh, that you'll have me back and uh oh my god and definitely. get nervous and we feel like friends and it's just another great interview one that you don't have to beat yourself up over later on exactly you know exactly I mean? yeah. <laughs> thank you i it, it really was a lot of fun talking talking to you and, and, and it, yeah it was it was it was really cool thank you no problem man anytime uh i'm sure i'll be back on oh definitely definitely yes all right, well, well, have a good night and uh, see you next time. All right, buddy. You, you, you too. Have a good one. You too, man. Peace. Peace.